So this is a project that um, I put together with uh, one of my former students, uh, Eli Asaf, who is now um, making more money than me as a, a data uh, scientist um, with, uh, with Humana. And um, nobody makes more money than you, Chris. Stop <laughs> that. That's ridiculous. Um, so, uh, um, and it, uh, this this actually goes back to uh, some surveys, some survey work that we did in the 2016 campaign. Um, and as we thought about the uh, the Trump um, campaign and how this would connect potentially to uh, foreign policy and how could we sort of uh, take advantage of this uh, from a research perspective, um, uh, we thought about how uh, Trump's uh, statements and arguments uh, going back in 2016 seem to be a real shift in uh, American grand strategy. And as we've talked about at this conference and elsewhere, that Trump really calls into question a lot of the basic assumptions that um, people have taken for granted in, in American foreign policy. Um, I, think, uh, I, I think I might differ somewhat from uh, Dan Dresner, say yesterday, who seemed to feel like there's a lot of uh, variation in sort of various different presidents, um, I would I would see the a, a great deal of consistency in the sort of basic foundations of American foreign policy, um, with Trump being uh, with Trump being a strong exception. Um, and one of the areas where Trump has challenged it is in uh, norms about uh, nuclear weapons and and nuclear use. Uh, let me start by saying I understand that um, the United States has never has never had. A no first use, a formal no first use policy, and I understand the role of uh, potential first use in, say, uh, Cold War thinking. But I would argue, um, at least since around uh, 1970, uh, one of the strong foundations of uh, American grand strategy, in particular, grand strategy for maintaining this sort of nuclear club at the uh, uh, at the top of the international system, which is strongly in America's interest. Um, there's been a pair of uh, norms that have underpinned that. Um, the first has been the nuclear taboo, which has been talked a lot by about by people like Nina Tannenwald. And uh, the nuclear taboo uh, norm also uh, gives rise to the uh, non-proliferation norm. And the non-proliferation treaty is, is uh, signed in, in 1970. And this develops as a strong sort of norm where uh, the US is basically pledging some level of restraint to not use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear states and um, and in exchange uh, uh, non-nuclear states are agreeing to not get nuclear weapons um, and that this has been one of the sort of key pillars that the U.S. has used to maintain the structure of the international system for the last uh, 50 years or so. Um, the, uh, there's been a lot of uh, recent work um, by uh, recent, I think, very, uh, very interesting and provocative work by people like Ben Valentino, Scott Sagan, Daryl Press, uh, suggesting that these norms are actually not very strongly instilled in public opinion and that elites would be free to violate those norms, use nuclear weapons first um, if they wanted to, and that they could generate a fair amount of uh, popular support for that. Um, there's a lot of literature in American politics um, that suggests that um, support for uh, elites may actually shape the attitudes that people hold. That is, during a campaign, uh, people may actually uh, reshape their attitudes to uh, fit the, uh, the people that they're voting for rather than voting on the basis of issues as we might like to think. Uh, that they would do. Uh, and then Gabriel Lenz has done some really uh, great work on this. And so Lenz would argue that if we see elites in the context of a campaign um, uh, endorsing uh, different sets of norms combined with uh, Sagan and Valentino's finding that the, the public doesn't, um, doesn't really strongly endorse these uh, norms of uh, the nuclear taboo and non-proliferation, that we might see substantial shifts in American public opinion about the first use of nuclear weapons. And this would open the door, I would argue, to potentially very large change in American grand strategy. Um, I think the key sort of missing link in this literature is that a lot of the really interesting work that Sagan and Valentino and others have done about uh, American attitudes toward nuclear first use 
involve a lot of hypothetical scenarios. So they imagine that there's a war and we're, we have ground troops in Iran and, uh, and you know, we have the opportunity to use nuclear weapons. Um, I've done work on hypothetical questions before and I don't think they're without utility, but I would argue that those kinds of scenarios are, things, are gonna be things that are very hard for people to imagine. Um, and so I'm not sure we should have a whole lot of faith in um, what that scenario uh, might really be. So what we need, I would argue, is real world evidence or what we needed uh, was real world evidence. And uh, for better or for worse, uh, uh, candidate Donald Trump um, gave us a kind of a real world opportunity uh, to test how uh, the American public would respond to a candidate uh, in the context of an election where people feel strongly motivated to line up their, um, their attitudes with uh, the behavior, with this, the statements of elites, um, how would an actual sort of um, statement that maybe we should think about using nuclear weapons uh, preemptively, um, would that work? So here's the statement from, uh, from Donald Trump uh, in, during the 2016 campaign. Uh, and so our idea was basically to build a kind of more realistic experiment uh, around these statements to see how the public would respond. Uh, so Eli, Eli and I uh, set up the statement. This is the base, or sorry, set up this experiment. This is the basic flow of the experiment. People come in and we do a bunch of uh, questions about de demographics and so on. Um, and then we randomly assign them to um, a, a, a speaker. Uh, they either get uh, Donald Trump as the speaker in their um, in their news story, or we created a um, a, a fictional uh, Republican. We wanted to we wanted to be able to compare the effect of Trump to the effect of a fictional generic Republican, and so we created Paul Evans, um, who you can see over there on on your left. Uh, that's not actually Paul Evans. Paul, that's actually a, a German politician. I can't remember his name anymore. Uh, but we created Paul Evans because that is the most common combination of first and last name for a wealthy, educated, fifty-five-year-old white male. So. Uh, <laughs> We figured that's a Republican candidate. Um, and um, uh, so we randomized the speaker. Then we also randomized um, what, what kind of statement the speaker is making. Uh, and we had three different types of, um, uh, three different types of uh, uh, news stories or statements uh, in news stories. And uh, one was a statement about um, criticizing the Iran deal, which was obviously a big news item at the time. A second was about uh, questioning the uh, non-proliferation norm. Um, so this was about proliferation to Japan and South Korea. And then the third was um, the, the quote that you saw before about questioning the first use norm. Um, we use, one of the things that's sort of complicated about our experiment is to figure out what's the control condition, right? What's the control here? And should we have a control where, where you know, they, people don't hear anything? Um, we're using the, um, uh, the statement against the Iran deal is our basically our control condition. So we're, we're comparing across treatments rather than with a true control. Um, and the reason for that is because we want to isolate the effect of norm breaking, right? So we wanted to have a statement about nuclear, uh, about nuclear issues um, that was consistent with um, American sort of foreign policy norms and then separate that out from norm breaking. Um, it would be the, uh, the comparisons that we want to make. And then we, um, and then we measured people's attitudes about each of these different, um, uh, about each of these uh, different issues. Um, so that was the flow of the experiment. Um, here's what some of our uh, treatments looked like. So this is the Paul Evans treatment. Um, the news story is just verbatim um, actual news stories uh, that, uh, that appeared in the news. Um, but the, and the only change that we make is that we um, attribute the statements either here in this to uh, Paul Evans or in this one to Donald Trump. Um, we, uh, uh, we tried to match, um, as you can see, we tried to match photos of similar close up and position and so on. Um, we actually got rejected from one journal because Donald Trump is sneering in this picture and uh, whereas the other person is not sneering. I would argue that's part of the treatment. If you're gonna have a Trump treatment, I would argue that the sneer is part of the treatment. But, um, uh, but at any rate, uh, that's, that's what the, um, uh, the, the treatment looks like. Um, so uh, 
so after people read these news stories, either the um, Iran nuclear deal, the um, Korea, or um, the uh, or the no first the uh, nuking ISIS story, uh, we then ask them about how they felt about the Iran deal, how they felt about nuclear proliferation, and how they felt about um, uh, nuclear first use. Um, so, oh, first here before I get into uh, to those results. Um, this slide basically is a lot of numbers to show you that randomization works um, and that um, all of our potential sort of confounding covariates are um, essentially equal across all of our um, treatment uh, categories, with the one exception that in the Donald Trump speaker, um, age does seem to be different uh, for the Iran deal. But given how many t-tests we're running, you would expect one of them to come out um, uh, significant anyway, so we, we argue that uh, basically we have good randomization. And so the numbers, that the, the um, estimates that I'm going to show you are predictions based off of models with no covariates, just the treatment effects. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do is see whether or not uh, Trump is different than um, our, generic, uh, our generic Republican in terms of how people um, respond to the cues. And what we find is that actually Trump does not seem to differ from our Paul Evans um, uh, Republican in terms of uh, how much how supportive they are of the Iran deal after they hear um, af after they hear Republican criticized how supportive they are of the NPT or of uh, first use um, in general or first use against ISIS. So um, we find that people are responding we're responding to Trump um, very much the way that they would respond to any uh, Republican speaker, Republican Q giver. Um, and so in all the subsequent slides I'm going to show you, um, I pull together uh, Trump and um, uh, Trump and Evans as the speaker. Um, I pull together those effects um, and it basically it shrinks the standard error some, but the, the, the basic results don't change if you um, uh, if you um, separate out the, the Trump analysis. So let me begin with this slide here um, and uh, say a little bit about how to interpret these slides. So on the vertical axis there, you can see this is the probability that somebody, uh, that a respondent says that the Iran deal um, makes, the, um, makes the world less safe, right? So higher up numbers mean you're opposed to the Iran deal. Um, the blue dots are how Democratic uh, respondents um, uh, res respond to the queue. Purple is uh, independents and red is uh, Republicans. So given what we know from the literature on um, elite queues, if people are responding as you would sort of normally expect to a political queue from, uh, from a news story, these are Republican speakers, so we would basically expect no response from uh, the Democratic um, uh, respondents because they don't care um, about uh, about what a Republican Q giver says. Um, the on the other hand, for the Republicans, we should expect if they get the Iran Q, that is the specific Q uh, criticizing the um, uh, the Iran deal. That should sort of activate their um, their belief that oh I should I'm I'm supposed to, I'm a Republican I'm supposed to be opposed to the Iran deal yes I'm going to increase my opposition to the Iran deal um, so we should see the Iran deal one be higher for the for the Republicans and somewhere in between for the independents and you can see that's exactly what we get Democrats don't respond to either of the Republican speakers at all in the Republican camp however uh, if they're told this critical story about the the Iran deal. Um, they become significantly more opposed uh, to the Iran deal. So what this tells us is that in the in our in our treatment category where people are getting news about the Iran deal, that is, they're getting news that is not violating um, international norms, not violating sort of the norms of American grand strategy. These are sort of typical um, uh, typical political positions. Um, our respondents are responding exactly as the sort of standard public opinion literature uh, would expect them to do. So then the next thing we want to do is say, okay, what happens when our elite speakers stray outside of this sort of normative uh, consensus um, that has underpinned American foreign policy for 50, for 50 years? Do Republicans continue to follow uh, their leaders? Um, 
into this new space, or if you were in, uh, from my perspective, off this cliff, um, or uh, do um, or, or do they try to hold their leaders back? And just, just one thing before you move on, yeah. just so I understand. So in in this graph here, where it says Republic, where you have the red Republicans, right? Mm -hmm. Where you say Iran Q. So you 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 gave them a Trump saying something that he didn't like the Iranian deal. And then you ask them, do you like it? And that's why it's up like that, right? Exactly correct. Right. But if, if you gave them the, the first use cue, and then then you would ask them the Iranian cue, then you'd ask about Iran deal, there shouldn't, you're saying there wouldn't be any movement necessarily because the cue wasn't the same, right? Wasn't there. That's right. Okay. So, so the only thing on this that we should, other than noticing that nothing moves, uh, is that that one thing from the Iran queue goes up, right? Am I right? right? Okay. And that's good. what we would expect, right? Okay. That if Republicans are told about this stand, reminded basically about this standard Republican position, um, they would say, oh yeah, I should be opposed to the Iran deal. And so my, my opposition should go up, right? That's, that's the one place we should see big movement and the other places we should not. Is 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 what, um, and that and that's what we see, right? Um, so then, um, what happens if we ask about the um, uh, the nonproliferation treaty? Here we can see that the that the usual cue giving effect goes away, right? Um, if the um, uh, so the vertical axis here is uh, the probability that you'll state um, opposition to. The, the norm of the uh, the NPT um, and uh, and if uh, if the public was responding as we would usually expect them to we'd expect that middle um, dot red dot there to go up right um, in response to Trump uh, criticizing the NPT or you know promoting um, proliferation and here we don't see Republicans following Trump sort of down that path um, and then as we expect we don't see um, Democrats um, or, or independents moving. Um, the other thing I would note is that um, across the board, uh, there's pretty um, widespread support for the nonproliferation norm, including among the Republican Party. So this is actually one area where there seems to be um, a pretty strong bipartisan consensus that nonproliferation is a good idea, um, despite what um, despite what Trump was saying about it. Um, we do, however, see um, a little bit of, uh, of an effect on nonproliferation in the following way. In addition to asking uh, respondents about um, whether, they, uh, whether they opposed the nonproliferation norm, which they didn't, we also asked them how important was that issue. And again, if you look over on the right-hand side of the graph, you can see that middle cue there, the people who got the proliferation cue, you can see that the importance of um, th this is the probability that they would say that the nonproliferation norm is very important. And you can see there that it does go down significantly um, for Republicans when they get that cue. And it goes down slightly for independents, um, although not statistically significantly. And then, of course, what, you know, as, as we would continue to expect, uh, Democrats don't respond at all. So this does suggest that while Trump didn't move actual attitudes about NP, uh, the NPT, uh, Republicans may be sort of coping with this cognitive dissonance of I like Trump, uh, but I don't like what he's saying um, by reducing in their mind uh, how important they think that um, how important they think that issue is. Um, same basic pattern holds when we uh, when we turn to uh, nuclear uh, first use, and this is uh, do you think do you support the the norm of no, uh, nuclear nuclear no first use? Um, again, we see relatively strong um, overall uh, support for the norm, although it's somewhat lower um, uh, somewhat lower among Republicans. Uh, but you can see that, again, on the right-hand side, if Republicans were really responding to this cue from Trump or from Paul Evans, we would see the far right red dot go way up high. And we don't see it at all. In fact, it goes down slightly. Um, so here we see you know, some part, some partisan gap on the no first use norm, but general support for no first use and really no response at all to um, uh, to the uh, to Trump's cue about uh, the use of force. Another finally, clarification question, Chris. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell them that America's policy is first use. We do not. 
You don't tell them that that's our policy? Okay. No, we just say, would you support the, the yeah, we, yeah, we just ask them, do you, do you support this attitude? We don't say, um, uh, yeah, we don't tell them what, uh, uh, what, the, um, what the actual policy is. Um, and then here we ask about um, uh, support specifically for using nuclear weapons against ISIS. Um, and uh, this was 2016 when ISIS was the thing. And, um, uh, uh, and again, you can see no, uh, no response to the cue. So Republicans hear this cue from Trump or from Evans um, and the far right dot does not go up. I would notice, however, I would note, however, and concede this point to um, to Ben Valentino and Scott Sagan, um, is which is that the uh, Republican level of support for nuking ISIS is pretty high. Um, so you can see this is one place where we really do see a big partisan divide. Um, Democrats and independents are not very supportive of nuking ISIS, although not zero, like 25%. Um, uh, but it's significantly higher among, among Republicans. And that's, um, uh, and so that is kind of a, a weakness to the norm um, that I think is consistent with things that uh, Sagan and Valentino and others have, uh, have found. Um, so in conclusion, um, uh, what we found is that um, while Trump might seem like a different kind of Republican and a different kind of Republican candidate, um, in terms of how the public responds to him, uh, they respond to him very much the way they respond to um, any uh, Republican um, politician in, in responding to his cues. It's not different than if you call him Paul Evans. Um, we also find, and, and they respond as they typically would, you know, to, to typical uh, Republican positions about um, uh, the, uh, the Iran nuclear deal. But uh, uh, contrary to uh, Sagan and, and Valentino and others, uh, we find relatively strong public support for the no first use norm of nuclear weapons and for the non-proliferation treaty. Um, pretty strong support and pretty resistant to uh, elite rhetoric and, uh, and movement by elites. Um, and so what we find is that support for these norms may actually be stronger in the real world uh, than what we're seeing in some of the hypothetical questions that have been asked. Um, there are, however, I would say some caveats. Um, uh, one is that, uh, as I noted earlier, Trump was successful in eroding perceived importance of the NPT among uh, Republicans. Um, a second caveat I probably should have put in there is there's a fair amount of support within, or there was a fair amount of support within the Republican Party for nuking ISIS, um, although they didn't respond to, to Trump's cue about it. And the final difference I would notice, note between our, our work here and the work that Sagan and Valentino has done is uh, they are working. They're working on um, intra-war scenarios. So war is already going on, and now do you use a nuclear weapons to try to finish the war? And that may be a different kind of thing than going into war. Um, going back to something that Lindsay was talking about in the last paper, and, and the importance of breaking out uh, the you know how public opinion matters at different stages. That may be an important difference between what we find, what we found, and what. Um, uh, Scott and Ben found. And with that, um, thank you. And thank you to the Decision Sciences Collaborative at The Ohio State University who funded this research. And thank you to Caitlin for whatever knowledge you can drop on me. Yeah, Caitlin, floor is yours. Thanks, Chris. Oh, here, I can stop sharing. Yeah, Sh stop sharing and then I can, yeah, good. There we go. Okay, thanks. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Caitlin McLeamrock, a third year PhD student of comparative and American politics. I'll be honest and say that I do not study international relations and foreign policy, especially not specifically nuclear policy. But what I find so excellent about this project is actually how many different subfields this theory and these results are in communication with. Because the main message of this paper is this indication from their results that the principles of nuclear non-proliferation, these norms and strategies of preventing the spread and use of nuclear weapons remain generally popular. Popular, Even an actor will very willing to message counter to existing norms like Trump, 
isn't able to unilaterally persuade the American public to abandon these norms and endorse their use and proliferation. So this is very interesting, even to folks like me who study political communication, uh, networks of political discussion and opinion formation. As Chris mentioned in his talk, many of us in this part of American politics usually think voters are relying on opinions and ideas just sort of at the top of their mind um, or whatever they've most recently encountered when they answer survey questions. So rejecting the idea that voters actually have true opinions on most political issues because most voters don't dedicate much time or attention to politics and political information. So most voters are absorbing certain parts of elite driven political communication, but the variation in which specific opinions and justifications for those opinions and norms a given voter internalizes actually depends on the voters political knowledge to understand whether that opinion or consideration is consistent with uh, their partisan affiliation or even their basic values. So we see this measurement uh, in the design. I think that was a great choice um, through a measure of basic political knowledge just as a function of factual information, how much um, basic political knowledge the survey respondents had here um, in the ability to identify certain political actors or political events. And it's also evident too, I will say that nuclear weapons are an area where the American public does have really useful priors. Um, they have a reasonable amount of knowledge, some reasonable opinion has been previously formed on the use of and existence of nuclear weapons. But still, um, we see public's, the public's attitudes as being very easily shaped by rhetorical cues from partisan elites. Um, so those of us who study partisanship and polarization think it's likely that most voters don't simply select candidates who they share policy preferences with, um, but rather because because voters don't often have true policy preferences on all topics, voters are just adopting the issue stances of candidates that they prefer for partisan reasons. So this is part of what I think makes the norm hypotheses so compelling here, is that if the norms of nuclear non-proliferation and no first use are weakly held, we should have seen voters responding to these cues in exactly the same way that they would to partisan messaging on other issues, meaning that Republicans should have expressed support for violating these norms when Republican elites were stating their support for violating them. This should have been even more the case if we think that there's a true Trump effect to be felt. Um, because we see this a lot and we hear this a lot in sort of mainstream discussions about um, long-term effects of the current Trump presidency. Uh, but what we're really seeing is that this paper is showing us um, that elite rhetoric continues to have no impact on attitudes towards the actual use of nuclear weapons. I do worry that because the taboo of breaking these longstanding nuclear norms, so expressing support for using nuclear weapons has already occurred in the real world by this point, that we might worry sort of regardless of short-term survey experimental results, that the longer term damage of these comments could be felt in the norm erosion several years later if the foundation of the norm continues to be softened. So I would be very curious if this kind of line crossing or taboo discussion might also have an effect that's felt elsewhere, like in political efficacy or trust in political institutions for Americans. Uh, but I just, again, want to emphasize what's so unique about this approach is that well, thanks to our current political environment and candidate Trump at the time, President Trump now, uh, this is one of our first true opportunities to understand how public opinion changes towards nuclear norms, which were previously well established, as they note, in a non-hypothetical way or setting. These are uh, actual opinions changing in response to a violation of these norms in a real world context. Um, they're using actual news stories by reputable outlets. They're just changing crucial pieces of information that could be manipulated, uh, but the quotes are direct quotes from then candidate Trump. So I think that's part of what makes these findings so useful and interesting is that the conversations are actually taking place in the real world context that voters are making their decisions in. So even if we think that most Americans are quite politically uninformed, we do know that the social context in which Americans participate matters a lot for their ultimate decision when casting ballots or when responding to opinion polls. So where I see such a wide ranging contribution to the literature and quite honestly, multiple literatures across subfields is that these findings aren't just speaking to IR scholars and those who study American military policy, though very thankful to all of you for letting me be here today, because I am not one of you, um, but also to the kinds of effects that we would expect from campaign messaging. So when we're studying and improving these comprehensive models of vote choice and political participation, we now have a better understanding of if and how these kinds of statements uh, violating norms 
percolate and do or do not successfully bring co-partisans into the same opinion spaces. So the stakes obviously are crucially high when you're focusing specifically on nuclear norms. Um, you also ask people to identify how salient these issues were to them, uh, but just more broadly kind of understanding how publics are responding to these kinds of manipulations and media appearances, I think is really useful um, for our understandings of voter knowledge, political and civic knowledge in the US more broadly. So I think the obvious direction for this project to grow in now that we're several years out from this, these sort of initial comments from candidate Trump and then also dependent upon who the next president elected in just a few weeks will be, um, would be these same experimental treatments, but then also potentially additional strategic norm violations that we've experienced over the past few years. Uh, I think this is also especially true if the real world risks of conflict escalation, such as in the wake of uh, the assassination of Iranian General Soleimani uh, is making this context more concrete. We could actually see this norm become more salient. It could increase adherence, um, though obviously we did see higher support, actually perhaps higher than predicted uh, for nuclear first use against ISIS by Republicans. So it's unclear if this actually would increase adherence, but I just think that's one opportunity um, where we might think that the context matters now, now that uh, conflict seems a bit more uh, real. Um, but this ultimately, I think, brings us back to why this approach is really essential, um, because it's so crucial that we understand how stable these norms are in the face of these short-term challenges by politicians. Um, I think public opinion stability in this realm is going to obviously continue to shape American foreign policy, interactions with other state leaders, um, not just by this president, but next presidents well into the future. Um, so using these three Trump statements, you know, first criticizing the Iran nuclear deal, which is a mainstream Republican position, but then second expressing support breaking the norm of nuclear non-proliferation, and then third entertaining the idea of using a nuclear weapon. I think uh, the two of you have really um, come up with an extremely clever approach where the treatment categories are actually isolating these two important variables of interest. And then also this really crucial identification strategy where you have the generic sort of hypothetical Republican, um, I guess now we know he's a German politician, Paul Evans, um, and a more mainstream policy position, the Iran deal. And so the Iran deal article even removes sort of the specific policy considerations that play into nuclear proliferation and nuclear weapon use, but it still primes the general nuclear threat. Um, so I think both of those two decisions are what make the ultimate results pretty satisfying because we can address this question of a Trump effect. So whether it's really that President Trump is unusual in his specific ability to rally the public and Republicans obviously in particular to support very unorthodox policies. But actually what we've been told now is that Trump is very much an ordinary Republican in terms of his ability to move the needle on nuclear norms with the public. So finding that Trump was slightly less persuasive than the fictitious Evans on the Iran deal and the use of nuclear weapons against ISIS, but actually slightly more persuasive regarding non-proliferation in other countries like Japan bolstering weapons technology. I think this is also really thought provoking when we think back to Sierra Croco's research earlier today uh, where we learned that on some issues, we can actually observe some Republican movement and opinion and approval of Trump policies, even if we're not ultimately able to change co-partisans views of his job approval. So even though Republicans really respond to rhetoric from their party leaders, criticizing the Iran deal, this sort of Trump effect and blind partisanship might be overstated contemporarily. When forming attitudes on nuclear policy, when they're thinking about these norms about the use of nuclear weapons. Um, Americans don't seem to respond significantly differently when the statements are attributed to Donald Trump as opposed to other fictional Republican leaders. So even though the nuclear norms aren't universal, it seems like among those who already have internalized them, um, no co-partisan elites, even Trump, will really be able to pressure voters into abandoning these norms. So I think that's what's very inter interesting to those of us outside of this specific issue area, um, certainly outside of IR. Um, and I've just really, really enjoyed the paper. I think this will be um, very interesting, especially to see sort of the next directions you guys decide to go into with this work, or I hope you at least decide to go into some next directions with this work, because I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, uh, Caitlin, that was great. Uh, Chris, do you want to respond to that or do you want me to open it up and then you'll respond during the course? Um, I'll just, just real quickly, the one thing I wanted to, to uh, underline in what you said in terms of um, things to do next, I really take your point about the longer term effects and like we don't know what, what is going to happen, um, you know, if, uh, if these 
uh, norms continue to be undermined, right? So like, um, you know, actually I probably should be doing this survey again right now, except that, um, uh, except that ISIS isn't, isn't the thing anymore. Um, but, uh, and so that makes it hard to compare, but, but I think you're right. Um, and I do think that that's, and you can sort of see that also in the, the fact that the, um, the importance of the issue got undermined, right? So that there's some way in which the like they're they're trying to sort of it, it's eroding it, it's eroding the issue a little bit for them. Um, and so I, I agree that that it that longer term effects would be would be useful to know more about, which is I guess often true for survey experiments. <laughs> Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Trump's got to stop being so successful and wiping out those terrorist groups. Anyway, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, Sarah, you're up. Okay. Uh, I think it's really interesting. I'm a big fan of survey experiments, and I'm going to be that person in the audience who tells you what to do in the next one as well, because mm -hmm. um, you can't change what you did. But so when I thought when you said like Trump taboo and like his effect, I thought you were going to go for like what people perceive Trump would be willing to do. And if that's different than what other Republicans, because that's what makes him not normal Republican, right? Is that we, he's more unpredictable or, or that's what we would think like looking at his Twitter feed. Like one minute he's like calling him, you know, rocket man. The next time he's talking about like his love letters with, you know, North Korea. So that's what I thought was the unpredictable thing about Trump or that's what makes him different. Like when you're just, so I'm just going to try to play devil's advocate here and say like, if I you know, saw this paper, I'd be like, well, yeah, we would expect Republicans to cue off a Republican president because who's, you know, our, that, like that partisan cue would kind of stand out for them when you're asking about the respondent's opinion about that policy. But if you're trying to predict what the leader is going to do, and I realize this is a totally different question, but like, that's to me what makes Trump different. Um, and that if you would, like, whereas if you asked about, you know, Evans doing something they might be like, oh no, he'll he'll toe the line. He won't, you know, go first use or whatever. But they might think differently of Trump. I realize it's a different question, but like to me, that's what's really different about him. Not that he sit, not that he cues differently, um, but that people have different expectations about his behavior. Um, I don't know. That's just my. Jesus. Sarah, there's a gigantic bumblebee coming at you. Hide. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's um, I think that's a fair point. I mean, that's certainly an interesting question, and I think you're right that um, he it, it may be the case that people have different expectations about what Trump would actually do, um, and that that is different about him. Um, I guess our sort of question here is is more like. Um, to what extent are people willing are is is the public and the public and particularly republicans here right who are the most likely to respond to his sort of cues to what extent are they willing to follow him um mm. and um uh and i think what you um we have a different so it, what we find in this paper is basically they're not willing to follow him in terms of um whether they will shift their attitudes you know, for people like Gabriel Lenz or whatever would say, all right, well, if this is where Trump's going in the election, then then the Republican, the, the mass of the Republican Party shifting that way. And and our our point in that sense is is to say no, that they won't. Interestingly, in a different paper that we have, um, we also find that um, while they don't shift their policies toward uh, their policy preferences toward Trump, they still say they're going to vote for Trump. So it doesn't actually um, uh, it, it doesn't actually undermine their willingness to vote for Trump. Um, Paul Evans, on the other hand, they are not willing to vote for if he um, uh, if he says those things. Um, so there is kind of a Trump effect in that way that like um, uh, that uh, other that a generic Republican politician gets punished for saying these things by Republicans and Republicans say, I don't want to support that guy. Um, but with Trump, that's not the case. Go vote for it. Okay. Yeah, no, I would just underscore that, like that, you know, we might think of it as, which you did, but like, just the, like, that they don't always follow him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which that's, is, that's, that's a cool a part. point for framing it. I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm not crying for Paul Evans because we know he's a rich white guy. So, you know, like, <laughs> so he doesn't get reelected. He's still rich. Um, I had a question about um, 
nonproliferation and a question about nuclear first use. On nonproliferation, two quick queries. One was whether you you asked you did a you did a kind of uh, what I don't know what you guys in survey research call this. You know, a basic knowledge kind of question. And like, do, are these people informed or not? In other words, do your respondents really know what nonproliferation actually is? The second one was it was really interesting that you asked them whether they support um, elimination of nuclear weapons which you note in the paper is indeed a former formal aspiration of the NPT, but it is not the one that is relevant for the United States. Um, I just was curious about, I was trying to interpret your results and think about your response having in mind the idea of eliminating nuclear weapons as opposed to stopping their proliferation. So those are two questions about that. Mm -hmm. And concerning the um, non-first use, um, I'm trying to figure out how to connect, like how to revise my thought about what Valentino Press and Sagan say, based on what you say, and I guess, or what you found, how, you're, how should I update my understanding of the taboo based on your findings? And the reason I'm asking this is because yes, ISIS was a real thing, and yes, Donald Trump is a real politician and he's giving cues, but it's still hypothetical in the sense that it's about would you know, would you, it's like, it's not a scenario in which there's this crisis and ISIS has done something and Americans are being held hostage and you're present, you're presented, you basically said, well, if you use a nuclear weapon, you know, only X number of Americans will die. In other words, the Valentino Press Sagan scenario was fake, but was about a specific scenario where people's, that where people were, had to confront a trade-off between saving the lives of servicemen to achieve some objective versus using a nuclear weapon. Whereas yours is more real in the sense that ISIS is real, but it's still completely hypothetical. It's just would you imagine that it would make sense to use a nuclear weapon as opposed to a more specific thing? Like ISIS has done this very specific thing and using nuclear weapon could prevent it or eliminate. Anyway, I just thought it was still hypothetical in some sense, uh, even though it is a, is a real world thing. So I was just trying to square like, if you had used a scenario in which it's ISIS but the scenario had the realism and trade-offs implicit in the Valentino Sagan press scenario, you might have seen some pretty big numbers, in which case, you know, the, the finding that the taboo is pretty weak would have, would have really been sustained, conceivably under that setting, if that makes sense. We have a cute cat uh, with us. I just want to point that out. I love cats. I, I, um, so great questions. Um, and in terms of uh, what they know about nonproliferation, uh, we, we don't ask them specifically about like, do you understand what nonproliferation is? We do have a, a political knowledge scale where we ask them some basic questions about do they basically know facts about American politics. Um, and um, uh, so, so we do account for that, but, but we, don't, uh, we don't know what exactly their understanding of uh, what what the NPT w would hold is? It's just sort of um, asking them. It tried. I try to. We try to describe what the policy is in the question, and then say, "Do you support that?" Um, building off of what was in the in the um, in the news story. Um, regarding the, you're right. I mean, your point is well taken about the um, uh, about the the fact that ours is in some sense hypothetical, right? Because ISIS didn't strike us and um, we uh, it didn't strike us again. And we, um, we didn't, uh, um, uh, 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 we didn't use nuclear weapons. Um, and um, the, the thing that I think is different about ours is, um, and at least the, the idea that we had about, uh, and maybe we should articulate this more clearly in the paper, um, is that um, taking like, so Scott and Ben's questions um, are, are very detailed and specific, but um, when people say, yeah, we should, nuke, we, should, we should use nuclear weapons and kill um, 2 million Iranians, um, nobody's actually thinking that that's a thing that is really could happen now. Like that if I'm supportive of that, that I'm somehow connected to this real thing that's happening. Um, Cause it's, whereas here you're seeing your Republican candidate advocate for this policy and 
that I, I think makes that that your connection to that policy is more clear and real. And at least our thinking was when the if, in the face of the reality of um, what it would really mean maybe to use nuclear weapons, that people would be more uh, circumspect in terms of um, whether they would update their positions. And at least I think that's what we that's what we found. Um, but it's true. But it's true that we do we don't ask some of the sort of trade offs of like, well, you know, uh, if it would save, um, if it would save, you know, 500 Americans from being killed in a bombing attack, would you preemptively, um, you know, strike ISIS or something like that? So, so you're right. It it isn't directly, directly parallel in that in that sense. Chris Ray. Yeah, thanks. Um, so first, I just have to say, after having spent four years at OSU, um, hats off to the illustrious career of Paul Evans, uh, who has just said some wild stuff in the media <laughs> since I've been here, <laughs> having quite a time. Um, second, so if I understand this right, the wording of the first use question is, some Americans favor the use of tactical nuclear weapons against ISIS as a way to quickly end the conflict and save lives. Others oppose first use nuclear weapons as immoral, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think? Right, that's that's the right question, yeah. Right. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, is there maybe some concern that you're, you've essentially ended up conditioning on, I could reasonably believe that using nuclear weapons could do literally anything to solve the problem of ISIS, uh, which is in fact like, right, not a reasonable, belief um, that nuclear weapons would help you solve this problem of like this embedded societal insurgency in the Middle East. Um, I don't know if that's conditioning on political knowledge exactly or like sanity. I just, the thing that it made me think of was that conversation that I think you and I have actually talked about with Nixon and Kissinger uh, where, where Nixon's like, I, I want to drop a nuke on the VC. And Kissinger's like, uh, it doesn't work like that. that. That wouldn't really solve the problem. He, he just says, like, I'm just trying to get you to think big, Henry, for Christ's sake. Uh, and, and so, like, maybe this is just, this is, you know, cutting the hair too finely here. Um, but, but it seems like there is something, some conditioning happening, unless we just think that there's a sufficient percentage of the electorate that actually thinks, yes, nukes are good for solving ISIS, which I suppose I could be convinced of. Oh, okay, right, right. So maybe, so maybe people are not responding because they're like, yeah, that's not a good policy tool in this situation. Um, yeah, and I, well, and in a weird way, right, like, I actually wonder if there could be some role for the, the Trump null effect there, where like, that would simply further, even among Republicans, that would simply further underscore their skepticism that this was a good thing to do perhaps even more so than a generic Republican, because they know sometimes, you know, Trump set, advocates things that might not be good ideas. Does? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I think that's a fair point. I mean, my sort of gut reaction, but I'm thinking about whether I have like data that can support it. Um, my gut reaction is that people don't think through whether particular policies are going to work especially carefully and um, they sort of take a menu of stuff that's thrown at them from elites and say well do I does that sound good or does that not sound good so I and so my sort of that's my that's my default reaction but I think it's a fair point to say that that um, that support for the nuclear taboo might not be the only reason not to nuke ISIS. Um, and, um, and so in that sense, I think you're right. I need to sort of back up that claim more as to why I don't think this is just people saying, oh, that would be poor. That, that would be a, a poor strategic choice or um, you know, if we, if we turn Raqqa to glass, like, I'm not sure that's going to solve the problem of ISIS and, um, yeah. Okay. 
Well, and, and really quickly, just uh, on that, uh, I actually, I think that's a pretty strong response. Uh, maybe I didn't buy it. Uh, but it also speaks to you, what you said, oh, well, if I want to run this again, but then I couldn't because ISIS isn't around anymore. I'm not sure that's actually a problem. Um, because I know in my American foreign policy class, I, I have them do like a sample assignment where they, they try and weigh in on uh, the Kurdistan issue. Um, and it's very clear from a lot of the responses the first time I gave that assignment that everyone still thought ISIS existed and, and was like just as strong as before. Um, I so so maybe you can just run this again. I thought you were going to say something more creative, like we wanted to bomb their graves, nuke their graves, so they'd be fossilized or something. Well, yeah. I mean, I think there was, I think there was a question uh, where, where somebody asked about, uh, like back during the Iraq war, people asked about like attacking Agrabah or something like that. Um, uh, yeah. And it was, yeah. Uh, it's very popular, had like, yeah, resounding support. I have one follow up just and then I'll go back to the list just a real quick one to piggyback because you're saying like you I think I'm coming out from the opposite direction because I was kind of like if there's one group that we really could nuke it's ISIS because they're they're so easy to dehumanize you know like to nuke a group you'd have to like really say they deserve it they're not they're subhumans I mean these we got to make an example of these medieval like in other words right they're so medieval they deserve nuclear weapons. You know, they're the only people we can come up with that deserve it, you know, because one, one more beheading and, you know, you're going to get nuked, babe, you know? Right. Like, no, so I think I that makes think sense from a kind of an emotional sort of, um, an emotional kind of response. I think Chris's argument was that actually dropping a nuclear weapon, if you really wanted to stop, say, I mean, if you think about what is ISIS, right? ISIS is people getting radicalized over the internet and, you know, renting a big truck and driving it into a crowd or something like that, right? So um, if you really want to stop that, dropping a nuclear weapon on Raqqa is probably not the way to do it, right? Because that's just going to make a lot of people mad and they're going to go rent more trucks and drive into more crowds. Um, yeah, but that sounds like the Woody Allen joke, but you know, it goes, you know, if you really want to get at those Nazis that are, you know, protesting, write something, an op-ed in the New York Times, you know, and, you know, and, and Woody Allen's like, no, you know, so, sometimes with Nazis, you got to deal with bricks and, you know, sticks. They work better with Nazis, the New York Times editorials, you know, like, I know you're being very intellectual about it, and you're probably right, that's not a good way to approach it, but maybe, no, but like, this, this is the one visceral thing that, in other words, I think you could make an excuse for it. I, and I'm backing you up. Like, I don't think this- I, I agree, no, I- I, I don't I think it supports Scott Sagan at all. Like, you know, I, I don't think it does. This doesn't, I don't think, support the Sagan view that Americans are just, you know, willing to use nukes on any, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with ISIS would be the one where you would think, yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop talking. Maybe I'm misinterpreting. It's not the first time. <laughs> uh, Kate, Katie, you're up. And then John Mueller. I know you're there, John. Uh, okay, once again, a great presentation and paper. So thanks, Chris. I saw an earlier iteration of this like years ago to conference, um, and it was great to see it again. It's been um, rejected by several journals since then, and uh, and and uh, re-edited. Uh, <laughs> re so I, but, I hope my um, I, I hope my next reviewer is as positive as Caitlin was. So. <laughs> the uh, studies. I can I can empathize with all of that. Um, so I have three, no, two questions. Um, so the, the first actual substantive question that I have, um, which is, I'm curious to just hear you talk a little bit more, and I'm not saying like go out and do another experiment, but, but I'm genuinely curious whether or not this is to you a paper about nuclear norms or a paper about norm breaking in general. And what I mean by this is here's the idea that you're showing that basically people don't just follow the leaders when it comes to breaking these nuclear norms, right? The Republicans aren't just following these cues from President Trump. But like he's broken other norms in international politics that I actually think you'd find stronger effects on. And the one that it comes to mind most salient to me, and one that I I again like I find pretty reasonable, is like meeting with enemies, right? He went about it in a ham-handed, dumb, non-strategic way, but he met with Kim Jong-un and that was like a strong norm that you just don't do that. And 
I'm curious to know what you think about whether or not you'd see the same type of non-effects or whether or not you'd see more effects with different types of norms, um, depending on sort of the consequences and the, uh, and the foreign policy implications of the norms. Uh, second, non-substantive, totally unrelated question, but it's been bugging me. Uh, what's the photos behind you? Like, wh where, is where is that photograph taken? That's, that's yeah. it. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, I'll go with the second one first. This is um, uh, Bally Castle, Northern Ireland. Um, it's right near the Cory Mila Peace Center um, in Northern Ireland is where, is where that is. So, um, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, um, it's my son's photograph, actually. Uh, my 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 uh, uh, my son lives in Pittsburgh now, so I have my Zoom set up in his old room. So, um, <laughs> um, so on the uh, on the other norms thing, um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think, I, I mean, uh, my my instinct is to give a sort of an empirical answer, which is that it sort of depends on how strongly internalized the norms are. I'm not sure that the meeting with enemies is a real norm that has underpinned American grand strategy. Because I mean, we used to meet with like the Soviets and we met, you know, and, and stuff like that and they weren't nice people. Um, oh, we and, do it all the time. I just think it pervades the public. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but there are certainly other uh, there, there's certainly other ways in which um, which uh, Trump has called into question various different norms. Um, Maybe like being friendly towards free autocrats. Trade. I'm sorry, what? Friendly towards autocrats? Yeah. Yeah, just like that. He treat he doesn't even like he's fine with looking like he wants to be friends with them. Whereas right. that would not be. You're just not old, you're not old enough to remember Nixon with Mao when he, yeah. when he went to the Great Wall. Do you remember what he said? He said, yeah. "This is a Great Wall." <laughs> <laughs> not wrong about that. that but I, so my but, but my instinct is to is to say it's sort of an empirical question. I mean, part of this for me, like you're asking, what's the sort of overall agenda, right? I mean, um, um. Uh, back in the day, um, I, I used, I, I did sort of research on like casualties and foreign policy and, and, and support for war and kind of um, what was really interesting to me about it was the extent, and this goes to why I asked Caitlin to, to be discussing here, part of what was interesting to me about that is to what extent did the public actually have some kind of internalized um, opinions and, uh, and attitudes about um, about uh, support for war as opposed to being you know shaped just by elite rhetoric and this is part of that same kind of agenda for me of wh wh what are the anchors of uh, of public opinion and therefore democratic constraint um, and so to me so you're right there are a lot of other and so it is sort of a more general question like that and there are a lot of other norms that you could pick and in that sense this could maybe be kind of a fruitful maybe I could do a book um, of uh, thinking about different types of different types of norms, um, so that's a great question. I'll have to think about my my gut instinct is to say it's an empirical question of how deeply internalized is a particular value, but but I I'm not really sure. I'll have to think about it some more. I, I, I appreciate the question. Yeah, and we also remember Harry Truman, Uncle Joe. You know, Uncle Joe's yeah stuff. yeah. You know. We've, we've, we've cozied up with autocrats before. We don't have any aversion at John Mueller. Uh, yes, I uh, enjoyed the paper. A couple of, one comment and a, and a question. Uh -huh. uh, uh, just underlining what both Bill and Randy said, the hostility toward ISIS was st astounding. Uh, and if what Chris says, they, uh, people still think it still exists, it's really impressive. But there's a poll in the, in the, when they're at their height asking Americans if they thought ISIS was a, a severe threat to the existence and survival of the United States. And 77% said yes. Uh, 50 of those 70 were based, said, they said that strongly. This is astounding for you know, a screwball, uh, crazy group in the Middle East. Uh, the other thing is that if you want to get on the Valentino 
uh, you need to say that uh, if we drop the bomb, it will save 20,000 American lives, which is which, 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 which what right. uh, okay. but to a degree. And so that, you know, suddenly it's not a, an abstract thing about no first use. We use it first and we save 20,000 lives. Anyway, I, I want to ask about the elite cues thing, see if I got it right. Um, what, what, you're, um, what you seem to find is that the elite, elite cues sometimes make a difference and sometimes don't. Is that basically correct? And also, you know, without the elite cues, right? You didn't just give them, you didn't just give them the arguments with no at, attribution. You instead had a uh, Trump say it in one case, and then the straight white male say it in the other uh, as a Republican, right? So you never said, here's, here's the, I, I just want to figure that out. So, so there's our, in all cases, there's an elite cue. Uh, in one case, it's Trump, and in one, it's, it's a generic Republican, right? Correct, right. And, and the variation that we find is that sometimes they respond to this cue and sometimes they don't. Um, and so they respond when it's within kind of a typical, the sort of uh, issue position that you would expect somebody to bring up during an election, and then they respond just the way you would expect them to. But when, when Trump strays outside of what would be typical Republican messaging, Republicans don't follow him. Um, uh, it's good to know. Um, but the, the, the point, I, I just wanted to so uh, go back to the point you made earlier about how much people were fearful of, um, and of, uh, of ISIS at the time. Um, and you're, that, that's, a great, that's a great point and probably something that we should um, emphasize maybe more in the paper that this you know, notwithstanding um, Chris's argument about, well, this doesn't really make sense as- It, it helps as, your argument, actually, because- Yeah, no, absolutely. Even, right. even against that, the group, yeah. That, that if these, they think that this is an, an existential threat, and yet right. they're still not work, willing to, um, uh, and, and yet they're still not willing to use nuclear weapons. So yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. I think we, that would help. Yeah, it, it helps, that would it help helps. shore us up against Chris's point. Yeah, thank you. Just to add on to that for for what it's worth, I I ask a question about ISIS in one of the experiments in my book, and so weirdly, you just spent a really long time justifying what a big deal this was in 2016. Um, and there is a long uh, Pew report that shows basically exactly just how fearful people were, especially around December 2015, and how salient it was because of the sort of spat of ISIS events in Western Europe and the United States throughout 2015. Um, so not only is there good data on that from, I, I think it's Washington Post, but there's also a, a big Pew, Pew report tracking the public opinion data on this that you could use to justify. Um, and if you send me an email, I'm happy to, to send it to you. Awesome. It, what, what, really, what, what really set it off was the, the beheadings, which were, at, it wasn't just Mosul, because that looked like it was just basically a full of Mosul and just seemed like, you know, Iraqis fighting Iraqis. But when they executed Foley and other people, it, it almost had a 9-11 effect, which is astounding. I mean, 9-11 was obviously a ma massive deal. Uh, executing a helpless prisoner is not exactly the same on, on anywhere. You know, it's a horrible thing. And putting it on the web, by the way, the execution. John, I also, I agree. Really with also, remember they were in cages when they lit the people on fire in the cages? That was just. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of things like it, but they were. I know, but it was a Jordanian pilot, though. That wasn't an American, so. No, 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 I, mean, I know. It wasn't America, but it was so subhuman that it was just, it was just, you know, can I start with, okay, go ahead, Chris, but I just, I was I, just going to say, that's a great point too. Both, I mean, both of those points are, and actually strengthen the, uh, that we should emphasize this more because that makes it actually re remarkable, right? Even though ISIS is violating all of these norms about how you're supposed to engage with prisoners um, and, and, and so on, ISIS is violating these norms and yet, people are still saying, no, I don't want to violate the norm of, of using nuclear weapons. As, as a Republican, can I just quickly, and I'll go to Caleb. I think if you want to know elite cues, Hannity, Rush, Fox News, I mean, I don't think Republicans, unlike Democrats, we don't like Republican members too much. We're not very into the Republican Party. I mean, you know, we see a lot of Republicans like Mitt Romney, et cetera, et cetera, and McCain as, you know, 
wishy-washy establishment Republican people who don't reflect our views. Trump actually reflected people's views in the Republican Party, not the Republican Party. And I think Trump is much more like Hannity, like Rush. If they tell you something, okay, now, now we're talking Republican. That's our red meat, you know? It's, 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 not, it's not Mitch McConnell. We couldn't care less what Mitch McConnell says, you know? You put Tucker Carlson in that group or no? Oh, he not? oh yes, thank God, yeah. Tucker, he's at the top of it. He's on Mount Rushmore now. I mean, you kidding? I mean, people hang on. Do you outrank Sean Hannity? I didn't realize he'd be on the same league as Sean oh, Hannity. Oh, Sh Sean Hannity's on radio. Const you know, he's on radio. His radio show's huge. You know, like Trump was on Rush yesterday for three hours, you know, for good reason. So, you know, or it was, yeah, I think he used the F word too. But anyway, again, that helps him among Republicans because he talks like us, you know? We don't want anybody. We don't want a hoity-toity politician. We like people that use the F word. But anyway, I, I think really, if you want to, I, I hope somebody does that sometime. Just say that the person saying it is Hannity. Make it up or rush. And, and I'll bet you they follow it. They That's think an interesting question. Yeah. The, the ratings for those guys aren't so spectacular. They're, they're high by cable standards, a few million. That's a lot. There's a whole lot of Republicans that, are, you know, there's a lot more Republicans. Yeah, but what, what about the radio, radio ratings? I don't know. Probably check it out. It, it's probably just a few million. That's a lot. That's a lot. No, they, they're, but they, they run the Republican. They're, they're the Republican Party. I'm telling you, it's not Mitch McConnell. Nobody knows what Mitch McConnell says. Nobody cares. I haven't heard a Senate Republican talk on TV in like months. Where, where are they? Um, we have Caleb. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chris. I, I really like the paper. Um, so thinking back to Bill Wolfworth's comment and also Sagan's counter prime presentation from earlier this week, I know like run more studies comments aren't always super helpful, but given that we are, sure. we're I in the midst study. of- I can run more studies. Yeah, and we have a few <laughs> weeks still to run another study when we're in the midst of an election. And there are some things outstanding from the first study that would be nice to clear up. Mm -hmm. um, so one is I think it would be nice to build in costs. Like I get that we don't have necessarily the casualty trade off, you could build costs in, in a way that's like, we could new guises, but for a Republican condition, we're also gonna have to raise taxes. Or for like a Democratic condition, you could do, we could nuke ISIS, but it will cause environmental damage because that's something that Scott found pretty strong effects for in a way that builds costs in. And so, you know, it's, it's like, it's cheap and easy to say that you would support whatever, whatever, you know, if there's no cost associated with it. Um, the second would be to maybe add like a military condition, because I think one of the things about this is because it's happening in the midst of a campaign, it's hard to disentangle. Is this just cheap campaign rhetoric where people are trying to get elected versus is this speaking at like the long term kind of nuclear taboo trend? Whereas if you have something or at least Scott's argument was that the military is a relatively neutral, trusted institution. If you had something like a, a military condition that was saying this, then you could disentangle the effects of like partisan um, uh, campaign rhetoric versus their um, versus something closer to a true control. Okay, yeah. So that that like if you had a Republican, so generic Republican, I could see I could see a um, uh, a military officer as. Um, I could see a military officer as a, as a real control there. I don't know. It's it's a, it's it's a double edged thing for me because, like, say my critique. I didn't get to talk about it on um, Tuesday when when Scott was here, but um, my critique of something like the experiment that they did, where they said, "Oh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff is is saying we should do X, Y, or Z." Well, in fact, in terms of how the public ever gets information. The Joint Chiefs of Staff are never, they're not advocating for things, right? It's, it's, it's the president who is saying we need to do X. And so partisanship is going to be, in any, in any real use of force, partisanship is going to be part of what the, the message that people get. And so, so I'm a little bit of two minds because on the one hand, I feel like, yes, that probably is a neutral control. And on the other hand, um, I would resist it because I'm not sure that that neutral control condition corresponds to anything that would actually 
happen in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Um, can, I, can I jump in there real quick, Chris? Because, uh -huh. you know, Peter and Jim Golby have done a couple of studies on, um, on cues from elite military personnel. Um, and basically what they find is that it doesn't make much of a difference uh, unless it's an unexpected cue. Um, and that it doesn't make much of a difference um, for, gosh, if I, if I remember correctly, it didn't make much difference for Republicans, um, but did make a little bit of difference for Democrats. But um, you sh there, there are a couple of papers that they have done together on that. So you could look at that if you wanted to build something like that in. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I, I, I'm, thanks for reminding me of those. I, I do, I have, I, 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 I know those papers. So yeah, that's a good point. And I actually have a paper with uh, a, a couple of other, uh, well, a student and a former student. Um, I guess they're both former students now with the other one graduated. Um, but uh, anyway, um, where we use um, military officers as a neutral cue compared to Democrats and Republicans. And we don't actually find very much difference. Um, and John, I, need, I don't know if I've shared this paper with you, John uh, Mueller, but um, we actually use your, tr your statistics on overblown um, as like the treatment to give people information about terrorism. And seeing your statistics really, really reduces people's fear of terrorism. So you need to keep trying to um, publicize, publicize your stuff because it... Uh, it definitely drives, if people, if people read it, it drives only place, it's the only place where it's worked. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? That's the only place that it's worked so far. It's probably why you can't get it published. <laughs> 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 no, but I, I, I love John's, I think every American should read the, uh, the John passage where he talks about the probability of, of terrorists getting nuclear weapons or whatever and it comes out to like one in 16 billion or something and it's like a uh, Rube Goldberg like they'd have to do this they'd have to do this and the odds of doing that is one in six billion you know I love that one anyway uh, the military should have to read that I haven't heard from David McCourt so I just want to say David if you have anything to say please unless you have like laryngitis I, I would love to hear from you you just turn yourself off <laughs> I'm feeling very out of place as a constructivist Euro style IR person. I'm not interested in audience costs one bit. So Chris, it's fine to talk about norms, but that's not how norms work. And in this case, the nuclear non-first uh, non use norm has nothing to do with domestic citizens. It's about decision making in executives. And so the norm would only hold for people like Trump if they're actually in a decision point when they have to make a, a issue of use, you've got to go back and read John Jared Ruggie's and Kratogfield's piece in 1986, where they say you cannot study something as if it's objective when its very nature is intersubjective. Norms don't work like causes. They are counterfactually valid. And so that means that you can ignore them as much as you want, and they still hold. That's the whole point about norms. So this whole literature is a waste of time. Look at you go, man. Um, <laughs> so I guess I, 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 where are you? Where'd you go? By the way, okay. Caracol and the Ruggy, my two old professors at Columbia, one with WTR Fox. Look at that. But so, that wasn't 96. You're talking about something in 86, aren't you? Which which article? Um, um a state of the art on an art of the state. Yeah, that's like I think 86, but maybe Sorry, I'm wrong. I, Chris, I shouldn't I shouldn't say it's a waste of time. It's just I get frustrated, like this is where IR is now, I get it, experiments is what's done, but you know, I, it's, just not, it's just not what I'm into. You know, I'm into sort of realism, liberalism, where, where did that sort of, where did that IR go? And I sort of lament it. I mean, no, 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 no sort of, I don't wanna be harsh on Lindsay and Kathleen, I know you're doing great work, it's just, it's not what I got into this for. But David, if you've got, if you've got all these like, you know, Broad brush criticism, you gotta let us in on it. That's why we're here. I like the bay. Yeah, I you probably noticed, you know. I, I like I don't you know, but we all agree it's boring, you know. So anyway. Well, it's, just, it's American well, it's politics. Not boring to me, but it's not IR. Um my I wouldn't agree with I well obviously I wouldn't agree with that because I because I wrote it, right? But um uh I would say so um I definitely um agree with your point that you know, that certainly these norms don't only exist at the, um, at, at the level of, you know, mass publics. And so, like, it would be entirely possible 
for for everything that you know Scott um, for, say everything that Scott and um, Ben Valentino uh, have said about uh, public opinion about nuclear weapons could all be entirely correct, and yet it still could be the case that the nuclear no first use, no first use norm is um, very strong because it's strongly held by elites and they have these intercept subjective understandings about what is legitimate use of force um, and and what are the what are the laws of war and and so I agree that 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 that, that whole that whole um, process could hold regardless of public opinion. Um, what at least may be interesting about um, uh, this paper or Scott's work or the other things like that is if we believe that some elites might not adhere to, might not have internalized those kinds of norms, um, to what extent do we think that something like democratic accountability might hold them to those norms anyway, uh, even if they haven't internalized them. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think that's an interesting question. Um, it's certainly not the only question, but, um, uh, but I think there are, you know, there are some elites out there who plausibly don't adhere to these norms. And so it, it's, I think it's useful to know uh, whether the public cares or not. Yeah, I agree. Again, I mean, I don't believe in, it's not about norm internal, internalization, because again, that's not how norms work. They're external to us and they, they have these, they are, as Durkheim calls them, social facts. They um, are, they sort of, uh, we reason with them and through them and they don't just provide sort of constraints. They could provide things that uh, might allow us to do certain things. So, you know, the norm of not crossing, the, of not jaywalking, uh, it's not about whether one's internalized the norm or not. You don't jaywalk unless sometimes you do, and quite often we do, right? And so the point is reasoning in the actual context, practical reasoning uh, that would be focusing on, well, what are the costs? And yeah, of course, public opinion views would be really relevant there. And I think that's right. It's just the whole framing of it. Well, it's a norm. It's, has it been internalized or not? It's just sort of barking up the wrong tree. The point is, like, what is the actual uh, reasoning that is justified, what, co what, what terms do people use in a particular way to sort of justify why they chose one thing or in another. And yeah, obviously we have to look at what, what someone might have said about a certain context. And so it doesn't really lend itself to sort of experiments because it's not about what might happen, it's what did happen in the actual context. Um, so yeah, again, that's just, that's just, it's just a sort of a But if I could respond to that, like, I don't think it's barking up the wrong tree. I think it's barking up a different tree because I think I think norms can be um, uh, sort of constructs used to to think and and, uh, and uh, work through choices and so on, or they can define sort of realms of possibility. But it, but it also can be the question of if something is a norm, like you don't jaywalk, right? We can then also ask an empiric. So that's a, a you're interested in the sort of normative. Um, um, uh, construction kind of question, um, yeah. but one could also ask an empirical question of, okay, um, what are the uh, we, what are the conditions under which um, this set of beliefs uh, is held strongly enough by people that they don't cross the street and they don't jaywalk even if there are no cars coming or something like that, right? And that may or may not be an interesting question, but it's not a wrong question. It's a different question. Yeah, yeah, that, I agree. That, yeah, I agree with Chris on that because, like, I, my reading of the article was about ontology fitting epistemology, this whole notion, you know, and and I don't think I just think, like Chris said, he's asking a different question because what they're saying is, well, you can't use an epistemology that says if you if it's false, you can falsify it. Like, yes, like you said, people jaywalk all the time. That doesn't falsify the norm that you shouldn't jaywalk. But mm -hmm. what Chris is saying is a different. He's saying. You know, if a leader gives you a different cue about a norm, you know, he's, he's explaining, he's not saying that the norm of the nuclear taboo doesn't work anymore or isn't true anymore. He's just saying he's trying to figure out why, you know, do cues, anyway, I'm not going to restate his argument. You know what his argument is. But I, I tend to do it, Chris, but I, 
you know, hey, if you're upset, please speak. Don't hold no, your no, no, no. I mean, grown, it's not kind of civilian castration. Um, I mean, just to, again to go back to the, the issue is that the norm doesn't really exist for the normal citizens. This is really, it's you know, we're talking about the wrong social context because her context is international politics. But that, that's an empirical like, question. Isn't that an empirical question that the norm doesn't exist for the citizen? I mean, I think there are lots of citizens for whom non-proliferation treaty or non-use of nuclear weapons, which isn't U.S. policy. They don't even know well, U.S. policy. Well, Randy, have you ever used nuclear weapons? No, but I still, can, I can still believe, I can still think that no, there's a nuclear It's not about what weapon. you believe, Randy, it's whether you're in a decision-making position to use, use nuclear weapons. It's only the executive and maybe that's people... That's the question, but that's the question you're interested in. But what I'm saying is that, like, I know that we have a first-use policy. I'm for it, but I would say I'm in the minority. That's what Chris showed, that most people are against it. They don't even know what use policy is, but they wouldn't believe that their government would have a first-use, but then they don't understand why. So, you know, anyhow. Well, the norm exists for people who may actually be able to ha actually have to use that's it. That's what you think. Chris is that's talking about something saying. different, which is public opinion on the use of nuclear weapons. That's not the same thing as the norm. Uh, I, I disagree. I just think that's convenient for you to say, right? But you're, you're acting like, it's like, you know, the people aren't that stupid. I, okay, they don't have the finger in a nuclear button, but they can still have an opinion about nuclear weapons, right? The norm. Right. Which might matter, I mean, in their opinion, might matter if the people who actually have their finger on the on the button care about what the public yeah. thinks. Okay, so maybe that can matter. I just give one example, right? Okay, you so let's go back to the consequences. Let's go back to the norm of cr not crossing the street. I think the analogy is there, there's the norm of not crossing the street, and then there's one person on the side of the street who's thinking about it, and then you've got a lot of people watching who aren't interested in, they're, they're not crossing streets. The, they're not even thinking about it. They're just watching that one person. And they might actually be represented politically by that one person, but they're not involved in the, the decision to, to, to cross or not. The analogy isn't perfect, but at least it gets you the sense that we're not talking about a norm that is active for, for most citizens because we don't, we're not involved in the issue of- But David, uh, here's the thing. That's, I, we have to go, we have to take a 10 minute break, but I would say this. I, I think that's a great, that's a very interesting point. You should write a paper about it. That is not intuitive. It may be intuitive on your side of the Atlantic, oh, but it ain't yeah. intuitive here. And so like, that's something you should argue. I don't think that that's, I don't think what Chris did is unreasonable <laughs> at all. You know, but if you think it is, you should make, you should write it down. Okay, uh, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, we'll come back in 10 minutes.